So I'm glad to see each and every one of you here. We're continuing with our Barsology series and just bear with me and stand to your feet for a few more minutes because we're getting ready to read the scripture. But we're continuing with Barsology, lyrical lessons from the book of Psalms. And so I want to come from the 42nd Psalm. So Psalm 42, we're going to read just three verses, five to six, and then we'll jump down to 11. I'll read it in your hearing. Here's what it says. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. Verse 11 says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. I want to speak to you this morning from the topic, Hope Activated. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and grace. We are grateful for your word, God, because we know that you are going to allow it to accomplish what it is you know needs to be done in our midst today. God, we thank you that we're not just going to be hearers, but we're also going to be doers of your word. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You can take your seats. First of all, I, I first of all, right? First of all, pastor said, here we go. Whenever somebody starts off with like, first of all, <laughs> you get a little tense. But first of all, why do y'all blow out candles on a cake that has to be shared between you and 20 to 30 other people in the room. Why do y'all do that? I, as a germaphobe, I, I stand in the gap for other germaphobes who have been silent for years, provoking our anxiety at your birthday parties, at your anniversary parties, just blowing out candles. When we had pastor's 40th birthday last year, he blew out candles on a cake and a layer that was designed just for him. Because the person who baked his cake made him a carrot cake at the top tier because that's his favorite flavor. Somebody else is saying amen. amen. Um, <laughs> and then we served cake to everyone else from another cake in the back. So I'm like, this is how you do it. This is how it goes. You blow out a candle on your piece. You don't blow a candle on my piece. You don't blow a candle on your aunt and your cousin's piece. And some of you are like, well, why not? Because there are more germs that you can't see than germs you can see. You can't really see germs, but you know they're there. It's like, God, you can't see him, but you know he's there. And so we're sitting there and we're provoked with anxiety. This psalmist may have written this psalm as a result of a birthday party. <laughs> My soul is in turmoil because you keep blowing out your Hanukkah candles over, over my cake. And we tell people, make a wish and then blow out your candle. And I'm secretly there saying, I hope it takes them long enough to make a wish that maybe I can cut off a little piece from the side before they get to blow out the candle. Blow out the candle, but first make a wish. But you know, speaking of wishes, wishes are very interesting because we hear about wishes not just at birthday parties, but we hear about wishes in fairy tales, right? Cinderella, uh, has, she had to make a wish, and Aladdin had to was granted three wishes. And we, we tell people in Disney movies and in fairy tales and even throughout life, make sure that you make a wish. The thing about wishes, though, is that some people get confused and believe that a wish is the same thing as hope. You believe that because you wish, you are also hoping in God. But I came to let somebody know today that you making a wish, you wishing that things would change, you wishing that God would move, you wishing for a breakthrough, sometimes that's all you're doing. You think that you're hoping in God. You think that you're trusting in God. You think that you're taking God at his word, but all you're doing is wishing. And the problem with a wish is that a wish by definition is desiring something 
that you actually believe probably won't happen. <laughs> See, if you say, I want to be in a better financial position by this time next year, but you don't actually believe it can happen for you, you have just made a wish. Even if you put God's name in front of it, God, I declare that I will not have the genetic disorders that run in my family. But deep down inside, you actually believe that you will come down with the genetic disorders. You're not hoping in God. You have just made a wish. And God is not moved by your wish. God is not moved by what you would like to see happen. He's not moved by what you would want to see happen if it could. He is moved by your faith. Amen. And sometimes in life as a Christian, you go through life and you feel hopeless and you feel in despair and you feel like you are distraught and you feel like you are there is no way out. You know what the reason is? The reason is you're like, I have hope, but I still feel down. I have hope, but I still am in despair. I have hope, but I'm still feeling discouraged. And God is saying to you today, if you are a Christian, if you are a child of mine and you are down, you are distraught, you are in despair, it is not not because I'm not existing it's not because I don't want to move on your behalf it's because you wish you don't hope for hope in God should at some point pull you out of your despair hope in God should at some point pull about it pull you out of your distress hope in God should at some point pull you out of your depression ask me how I know because when I was dealing with depression, I actually had gotten to a point where I said, perhaps this is my lot in life. Perhaps I am a child of God, but I have to be depressed. I literally started saying, even though I am called to be used greatly by God and mightily by God, perhaps the thorn in my flesh is that I have to be depressed. I wanted it to change. It's not that I enjoyed being depressed. And after so many years, anxiety then came and attached itself to the depression. So it wasn't that I was enjoying it or that I liked it. But God had to get me to a point to realize that the reason why you don't have a breakthrough is because you don't actually believe I can take you out of it. You've been sitting here saying, well, maybe I'm just supposed to be a weeping prophet. Or maybe I'm just supposed to be down. Well, some people, I literally started rationalizing it in my brain. And I said, some people have terminal illness and, and some people are in poverty and, and some people are dealing with this and dealing with that. Maybe I just have to deal with depression. And I thought I was hoping that things would change, but I wasn't hoping in God. I was wishing that things would change because I wanted them to change, but I didn't believe deep down inside that it ever really would. And... Uh, I thought, maybe I just have to be a weeping prophet. And the irony is that even after I got delivered from depression, my husband still calls me a weeping prophet. <laughs> Somebody said, cry on. I, listen, I do cry. To the point where if I come in, this is how bad it is. If I come back into our room and I go, or I come downstairs where my husband is, he never says, oh my gosh, are you okay? Oh my God, are you feeling unwell? Oh my God, did something happen? You know, there's no concern. He says, grab a tissue. I know you just came out of prayer. <laughs> or he'll say, hey, Jeremiah, it's good to see you. I know you just came out of prayer. In fact, it just happened uh, Friday. Came out of my afternoon prayer. And I was like, uh, so Mark, he was like, first grab a tissue, Jeremiah. First grab a tissue and then we'll talk. <laughs> and I'm like, that is... All types of room. <laughs> what if I had hurt myself? What if I was in distress? No, you over here talking about Jeremiah, we have plenty of Kleenex in the laundry room. Get yourself together because we have a meeting to get on. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, listen, somebody has to cry aloud and spare not. Okay? Right. Yeah. You want to see this city change? It's going to take a cry crier. And I know some people are like, but PJ, are my prayers not effective because I don't cry? I don't know. I'm just saying mine are effective and I do cry. <laughs> I can't speak for you if you don't cry. I don't know because I don't know what it's like to pray and not cry. <laughs> I don't know. 
Lord, I'm getting off track. So the thing about hoping and wishing in God is that what is it that really starts eating away at your hope, though? Is it just that you don't want to believe God? Is it just that you've never seen God move on your behalf? Is it that you really think that God is out to get you there? There's got to be some reason. There's got to be some deep-rooted reason why you're a child of God, and yet you start losing your hope. And I started to realize the more I be, was studying this text and the more I was praying, I started to realize, and God showed me, that it's the trials of life that start to eat away at people's hope. It's the frustration of going through a heartache back to back. It's the pain of going through situations that you never thought in your life you would have to endure. It is the confusion when God promises you one thing and it seems like in your life you are actually enduring and going through another. It is the stress of life, the pain of life, the heartbreak of life, the confusion and the frustration of life that starts to eat away at your hope. And then before you realize it, you are still a child of God. You are still called by God. You are still called to do a work for him in the earth. But before you even notice it, you are no longer hoping or trusting in God. You are just wishing that things would change. Because hope in God, by biblical definition, is the belief and the confidence that something or someone is going to change uh, hope in God is also the confidence that God will shift your situation because he has already given you a basis for believing him he has already shown you enough of his track record that you can be confident that God I've never seen you do this in my life and I don't know how you're going to do it I don't know when you're going to fix it I don't even know how long I'm going to have to suffer here but the fact that you are God means that I can have hope and so some of us lose our hope because we are waiting for the situation to change in order to have hope but you don't have hope because of your situation changing you have hope because you know who God is you have hope because you know you belong to Jesus you have hope because he is Adonai you have hope because he's your Elohim you have hope because he's been your Jehovah Jireh and your Jehovah Shalom and your Jehovah Nisi see in the past God I don't need you to fix it now I can have hope because of what you've already done that is why you hope in God but in this Christian walk trials eat away at our hope and the thing about trials is that you cannot get away from trials it would be great wouldn't it some of us think to say, once I got saved, all my trouble was over. Once I got saved, all my problems were over. In fact, some Christians have the testimony, once I gave my life to Christ, then all hell broke loose. Right? Because you switch teams. <laughs> Enemies not coming after you in the same way he's coming after somebody who's living for God, who's sold out for Christ. It's not that people who live on the enemy's side have peace. And have real joy. But he attacks them differently because he doesn't have to try to get them off track. They're already off track. So what happens is you go through life and you have trials and you think that it's so odd. It's so odd that I'm under attack. It's so odd that I have this health issue. It's so odd that I've always seemed to be struggling. It's so odd that there's always something going on in my family. But 1 Peter 4 verses 12 to 13, you can write that down for those that take notes. Here's what it says. It says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So what is happening in 1 Peter is that the Bible is saying to you, you actually shouldn't be surprised when you go through trials. You also shouldn't think that something strange is happening to you. When I was going over this message, God said, tell my children what's happening to them right now is not strange. It is sanctioned. 
<clears throat> Let me say it again for the people in the middle. I was going to say for the people in the back, but I think the people in the back said amen. God said what you're going through right now is not strange. It is sanctioned. Because whatever you are enduring has been sanctioned by God. God did not create the illness. God did not uh, force somebody to betray you. God did not force somebody to uh, cause you harm. But he allowed it and it's been sanctioned because these trials are meant to grow you. These trials are meant to stretch your faith. These trials are meant to stretch your hope. If you don't think that God sanctions trials, you have to remind yourself about Job. Amen. Because the Bible tells us that the enemy had a conversation with God. Yeah. And he's like, what about Job? I mean, of course he serves you. He doesn't have any problems. He doesn't have any real issues. And he's like, God, I want to touch him. And God says to the enemy he says to satan you can touch him you just can't take him out you can't destroy him little did job know about this conversation that was going on when god actually sanctioned his trial what do you do and how does it affect you to know that the savior has sanctioned satan to put you to trial when your savior who died for you, when your savior who tells you he loves you actually sanctions your problems, actually sanctions your heartache, actually sanctions your pain. Peter says, don't be surprised. And yet we're here and we're shocked that we're going through. Why are you so surprised? You think the enemy only had Job to bring on his list? The enemy has an entire roster. And he's like, God, what about PJ? God, what about Eliza? God, what about Kaya? God, what about Cash? God, what about all these people at Link Church? And he goes down the list. And guess what? There are some problems that God said to the enemy. You're not doing that one, though. You're not enacting that level of pain. You think the pain that you had is unbearable? You haven't seen anything like the pain that God spared you from. But then there is a level of pain that he's like, I know ultimately if they go through that, they're actually not going to leave me. They're actually not going to have their faith destroyed. They're going to think about leaving me. They're going to think about not trusting me again. But ultimately it's going to work for their good because they are called according to my purpose. So yeah, you can touch them there. Yeah, you can make that a pain point. And then what happens is God says that, you know what, this is good. And so I believe when these things happen, both God and the enemy start to laugh. The enemy laughs because he thinks this is going to be the final straw and that after this you are going to stop serving God. But God laughs because he knows your hope and your faith is getting ready to be strengthened as a result of this trial. It's the reason why God sanctions trials. We know why God sanctions trials when we look at Romans chapter 5 verses 4 to 5 because it says an endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us and so what happens now is that God knows one some translations say trials work patience right so your character is really your patience your trials if you go allow God to take you through them your trials begin to build up your patience and then the more you are patient and you wait on God then then your hope begins to grow your confidence and your faith in God begins to grow at, as a result and then what I like about it is God says also you should know that your hope in me will not bring you to shame you can hope in an entity and be put to shame. You can hope in a person and be put to shame because they're not foolproof. It's not a guarantee that they'll come through the way that they were supposed to. But God says, when you hope in me, you will not be put to shame. So if we know that trials will come, then the question we're asking today is not whether or not trials will come, 
but rather how will you navigate your life when trials do come? Because we've established that we can escape them. And what's interesting is that in this 42nd Psalm, in the verses of scripture that we read, we actually have an answer for how a child of God should navigate life when they go through. We see here in these verses in the 42nd Psalm how God gives us the blueprint. He gives us the download for how to have our hope activated. Because it's not enough, as we've established, to say that I want things to change. I don't know anybody, Christian or not, that doesn't want life to get better, that doesn't want life to get a little easier. So it's not going to be enough for you to want or desire things to change. You've got to have the blueprint and the formula. So if you go to verse 6, if you go back to verse 6, it says, And my God, what I like about another version that I was reading is that there is a version that starts verse 6 by saying, Oh, my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and of Mount Mizar. Now, you might say, well, PJ, I don't see a blueprint in that verse. You have to look closely because the first part of the verse is telling you the first thing that you do when you find yourself in a trial. If you look at another version that says, oh, my God, or you're even looking at this version where the... Uh, Second and third words are my God. The first thing you do when you're going through a, a trial is you remind yourself of to whom you belong. Elohim is my God. Trial, you are not my God. Pain, you are not my God. Poverty, you are not my God. Sickness, you're not my God. Confusion and frustration, you are not my God. Divorce, you are not my God. But you're letting your trial know, I have a God and he is not you. My God. So step one to activate your hope is to remind yourself that you have a God and his name is Jesus. His name is Adonai. His name is Elohim. The second thing you do in verse six, it says, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. What is the psalmist teaching us here? That the second step is that you've got to remember what God has already done. Because the psalmist is saying, I am so depressed right now. I am so overwhelmed in my spirit. I am so low in my spirit that I can't seem to find any confidence in what God is going to do. I can't seem to find any confidence in what God is even currently doing. But he says, my soul is cast down. Therefore, or so, I remember for you from back in the day, God. I remember that we've been friends for a long time. I remember that you've already brought me out. I remember there was a time when you gave me a song. I was remember there was a time when you delivered me. I remember there was a time when you healed me. I remember the time when you saved me. I remember the time when you restored me. I remember the time when you opened the door that nobody was able to shut. I remember the time when you gave me the key keys to the kingdom I I remember all of that God and so the first thing I do to activate my hope is I remind myself that I belong to God and then after I remind myself that I belong to God I remind myself that he's also already made a way but then there are more steps to activate your faith because the psalmist says in verse 11, he's asking his flesh, he's asking his soul again, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you with turmoil within me? He then says, you know what? You don't even have to answer that. Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So your next step is to hope in God. You've reminded yourself that you belong to God. You reminded yourself that God has already moved on your behalf before. And so what that should do is start to activate your hope. It should start to activate your confidence. Do you know that children are confident in parents who continually show up? Right? So for example, 
When we struggled financially, not only were my kids too young to understand that, but I believe the reason why they were still playing outside, they were still laughing, people would even say to us, you just seem to have some really happy kids. You know why? Because their confidence was in the fact that mom and dad will always get food on the table. Their confidence was in mom and dad will always see to it that we have clothes. They didn't know how we had, what we had to do to struggle to get food on the table. They don't know how we had to struggle in that season to get clothes on their back. They don't know how we had to struggle in that season to keep the roof over our heads. But they were confident in us because they'd seen us do it all before. They had already seen us give them a meal three times a day, every day. They'd already seen us open up the door for them to go in and sleep in a house every day. They they had already seen us give them clothes and an outfit to wear every morning and so their confidence was built and their hope was activated why was their hope activated because I belong to Mark and Jen Watson then they took the next step and said not only do I belong to them but they've provided for me before and so because they've provided for me before I've got confidence in mom and dad I've got faith in mom and dad I've got trust in mom and dad I hope in mom and dad because their track record is solid because they've never failed me because they've never done me wrong they might correct me they might punish me they might tell me something I don't want to hear but ultimately their love for me is strong and it's evident and that is where my hope lies so your hope should be activated simply off of knowing whose you are and what he's already done that's why the psalmist said to his soul, why are you still down? Yeah. Why? Hope in God. We've already seen what he can do. But then he said, I'm going to take the next step and let you know that I will praise him again. Yeah. See, your hope is not just activated by your confidence in God, but it is activated by your worship of God the psalmist never said I will praise him again once I'm delivered I will praise him again once I see the breakthrough I will praise him again once I understand what he's doing in my life you can go through many different versions of this psalm and you will never see a part of verse 11 that says I will praise you once I see what you can do the psalm simply says and no matter what version you read whether you read the new, whether you read the King James Version, which I believe only Vanessa can understand because she's from England, or you read the version that I read, listen, the British English, I like British English personally, but I'm just saying that unless you're coming from where King James is coming from, you don't know what that version says. So you read the ESV, which is what we used here today. But no matter what version you use, you will never see a part of the scripture that says, I'll praise him once he shows me what he's capable of. The psalmist simply says to his flesh, hope in God because I am going to give him praise I am going to give him worship it's as if the psalmist is saying to his flesh my hope is activated and I'm not going to praise God based on how you feel I'm not going to praise God based on how down you are I'm not going to praise God based on how racy your thoughts are I'm not going to worship God based on what he's getting ready to do or how he's going to do it I'm hoping in God for what he's already done and I'm praising him for who he is I'm praising him because he's good I'm praising him because he's faithful I'm praising him because he's loving I'm praising him because he's kind I'm praising him because he's gracious and he's merciful he saved me though I don't deserve to be saved I deserve to be unsaved I deserve to be walking the streets I deserve to be on my way to a burning hell but because he is mercy because he is plenteous in mercy he did not give me what I deserve but he gave me what I needed he looked beyond my faults he looked beyond my flaws and he saw my need and so flesh you can feel how you want to feel you can sound how you want to sound it can look however it looks but flesh and soul I'm letting you know what we're gonna do you will not dictate to me how I will navigate this trial you will not dictate to me how I will go through life I dictate to you what we're gonna do we're gonna hope in God we're gonna worship God we're gonna praise God we're gonna thank God why? Because he is my God. He is my creator. He is my El Shaddai. He is my Shalom. He is my joy. He is everything that I need. He is, I am, that I am. And soul, if I wait on you to tell me what I should do, I'll never be free. I'll 
I'll never break through. I'll never be loosed. But if I want my hope activated, then I will take the four-step process of remembering that I belong to God, of remembering what he's already done, then having my hope activated and letting that activated hope turn me into a worshiper. When you see people come in on a Sunday and lift their hands, you got to be joking if you think they're lifting their hands because everything's already worked out. You got to be joking if you think they're lifting their hands because it's already figured out. They're lifting their hands because they know that it doesn't matter how, doesn't matter when, it only matters that who I serve, if he's done it before, he will do it again. no accident that God gave us this word on Rosh Hashanah you're like PJ it's an accident because I'm not Jewish well it's not an accident because remember what I said the rabbi said that they look at the scriptures and they realize God gave them and gave us the scriptures not just for us to meditate on it but for us to know that these are recurrences that God always intended for what he did for one person to be a recurring theme that he would do it for the next person and that he would do it for you and so the reason why the reason why the psalmist remembered God from the past is because he realized wait a minute I'm a Jew I know better than this I shouldn't be sad I shouldn't be down I shouldn't be distraught because I remember that the rabbi told me when I was younger that you look at God's track record and you look at what he's already done for you and you put two and two together and realize he did it before he actually wants to do it again and then I'm glad that that rabbi said what he said because even as a Christian it set me free because I realized wait a minute God you've brought me out before wait a minute God you've healed me before wait a minute God you've answered a prayer before and you want this to be a recurring theme in my life where I go through and you pull me out where I go through and you pull me out I go through again but you pull me out and so somebody in here today needs to know that God's deliverance and God's salvation and God's rescue for you is supposed to be a recurring thing. You hope in God not just because he did it in the past. That's only part of it, but you hope in him because he's getting ready to do it again. If you're standing, you can remain standing. If you're not standing, you can stand because I'm wrapping it up now. But God said, Jen, there are some people that are going to be there on Sunday. And they're coming not even necessarily because they're so excited to come. They, they love their church, but they're just down. They love their church, but they're just frustrated. They love their church, but they are just feeling distressed and feeling distraught. But I want you to remind them that the difference between their bondage and their breakthrough is them moving from a place of wishing to a place of hoping. So long as you wish for things to change, you will be in bondage. Because wishing comes from a place of not really believing. But the minute you ever dare to hope in God, to trust in God, to declare to your flesh I know he's gonna do it again the odds are stacked against me I don't even see the signs for how he would do it again but just because I know who he is because I know he will never leave me or forsake me then I know he'll do it again and that is the point at which you will experience breakthrough that is the point at which your hope is activated God came this morning to activate somebody's hope You've been wishing long enough. You've been dreaming long enough. God is saying your dreams and wishes, that's okay maybe when you first get saved, when you first know who I am, but you've been walking with me for a while. Your hope now needs to be activated. You've been wishing and you've been dreaming, but you've got to get your hope activated. And the thing about having hope in God is that you first even have to be in a relationship with him. You can't hope in someone that you're not walking with, that you don't talk to, that you don't know what they can do for you. So we're going to take some next steps here. I'm asking everyone to close your eyes at this time. Prayer team, you can actually come forward right now. 
with your eyes closed the first call that I'm making is actually going to be for someone who says I don't know how to hope in God because I'm not walking with him I want you to know that God is for you I want you to know that he wants to save you he wants you to walk with him and so if you know you're not saved or you know you need to rededicate your life to Christ while the rest of us have our eyes closed I'm just gonna ask you to lift your right hand and lift it high we've got one we've got one I see at least one hallelujah if you need to give your life to Christ or rededicate it you can raise your hand high now this next call is for somebody who has been walking with God but you actually have been walking around hopeless you have been walking around helpless you have been walking around feeling as if it's probably not going to happen for me if that's you I want you to take a step forward so that we can join with you in prayer and in faith because it's just been hard for you to believe in this season it's just been hard for you to trust in this season it's just been hard for you to understand that God wants to do it for you and so you can continue to make your way to the altar because we want to stand in faith with you believing that not only God can but also that God will your promises stand forever your promise stands forever your promise stands forever I see you do it again I see you do it Right now, God is releasing hope in this room because in order for you to make it through this, you need hope right now. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, we're going to pray in this room. We're going to pray not wishing for God to do it. We're going to pray believing by faith. In this moment right now, after that sermon, We've got to release a prayer of faith. We've got to pray through this situation. We've got to know that our hope re rests in God. Our hope is reliant on God. So our hope is the thing, is the substance that gives foundation to our faith. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. So we need to ignite hope in this room. We need hope to arise out of the ashes of our frustration. We need hope to arise out of the ashes of our neglect, out of the ashes of our pain. Come on, I need somebody in the room right now that will begin to pray. This moment, this word right now can change the next season in your life. Because you thought, you thought, you thought that God was going to leave you hanging. Thanks for watching our service today. We hope and pray that you are encouraged. We love to give here at Link. There are two convenient ways to give to our church. You can text the number 84321 or give online at linkchurchnc.org forward slash give. Join us next week for Link Online. We pray that you have a great and blessed week.